Well, I guess we're ready. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? It's good to see you today. Welcome to Calvary Temple Church. You are Calvary Temple Church, the people of God, and it's so wonderful to be able to gather together. This morning as we begin our time, like we try to do the first Sunday of each month, we are going to give you a report on our MAC contest. MAC, M-A-K. Do you know what MAC stands for? That was interesting. I don't know about you, but what I heard was high stress. <laughs> um, so that could mean that. It might be your hearing. Or it could mean me and Kenza, right? And MAK? Kenza's totally back to me. She's <laughs> not paying attention to you. Or it could mean missions and kids. It, it, I think it does. I think it probably does too. So we're doing this contest. Uh, where we are raising some money for a particular project. We are working uh, with some partners in Jakarta, Senegal, Africa, and we are doing what's called the BAM project, bricks and mortar. And so $2 will purchase a brick for restoration centers that are being uh, constructed through Jakarta to help the street children be fed, housed with shelter, educated. And so we're partnering with those workers, Guy and Jane Penny, from Mountain New Brunswick, who were just here a few months ago. And so we want to give you an update on this contest. We, and I'm going to let you do this one, Pastor Jen. You're going to let me do this whole thing myself? Yeah, you go right ahead. Someone laughed somewhere. <laughs> when she said that, I'm going to let you do this whole one, Pastor Jen. Someone at the back went, ah, ah, ah. Who that was. Um, we, we collect the donations in these bins here, girls and boys, or digitally you can give uh, to MAK girls or boys. Girls. And so, oh, and so how come, how come my mic never gets muted? And uh, so we're going to get a little report from the last month. Each month we do this contest. Here are the totals for last month. Are you stalling? No. Okay. Between the gentlemen and the ladies, the boys and the girls, here we go. What came in last month for the gentlemen? Ooh, was $67. Yeah, give him a hand. And we know that usually, historically, normally, the ladies are much lower than that. It's just the way it is. I don't know why. I, didn't, I don't feel it. So Here it comes. Church heating furnace oil bill situation. 
Uh, we had a $15,000 bill for the church heating oil uh, system because, of course, through the winter we accumulate bills. And so I want to report today the update as of this past week. We've raised uh, 7447 towards that $15,000. Let's give the Lord a hand. We only owe now less than half of the bill, seventy-two fifty-three, and so we're, we're doing well with that. You can make a donation today if you wish, Mark, oil or heating. And we want to continue this spring ministry season without having this bill hanging over us and being able to move forward. So please help us if you can. God is bringing it in. Number, what's happening here tomorrow afternoon? Yeah, we have prayer happening. We have our prayer ministry. It's at 1 o'clock right here in the Tampa area. You can come in person and pray together if you'd like to. Please join us if you can. Number three. On this Saturday. What are you doing this Saturday? Cleaning me. Yeah, we have a church spring work and cleaning me right here. 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. It's drop-in. If you want to come at 9, you can come at 10. Please come and help us if you can. There's a whole bunch of tasks to be done. There's cleaning and there's uh, tidying, outside work, inside work. If you can do this, you can help us. So if you're able to do this, you can more than help us. Please sign up if you can on the sign-up sheet in the foyer today just so we can plan for you. Number... Or no, I'll skip. Number four. Please help us spread the word to your family and friends. Next Sunday, we have a special uh, draw that's happening. We have a Mother's Day gift basket fundraiser happening right now in our church. People can make a donation to this contest. You can see Stacy, uh, who's in the sound booth or at the table earlier. You can make a donation in this contest and receive a ballot, one ballot per individual. Suggested donation is $5. We have a lovely springtime prize basket with iced tea, coasters, tea towels, juice to spend and Trey. Donations can be made into the church at any time or through the transfer or our giving website. And uh, we'll look to draw that next Sunday to see who takes that home. Number five. What's happening next Sunday? What's the holiday next Sunday? Some of you are like, there's a holiday next Sunday? What? Mother's Day. We invite you to our Mother's Day worship service next Sunday morning right here. We will be honoring every lady present. We're not just only about mothers here. We will be preparing a special tribute to all ladies in our church and of course honoring our moms as well. Uh, as part of this celebration, we are preparing a tribute of the ladies of Calvary Temple. If you are not willing for us to show your picture on the screen as part of all the ladies of the church, you need to tell us because if you do not specifically tell us, do not use my picture. We have been on Facebook. We have stolen your picture because you silly put it on there and we've taken it. So please be aware your picture, if you're a lady of the church, will be on the screen. You need to tell us not to put it up, otherwise it will be there. Number six, what election is happening in our church right now? WM. That's right, WM. Please see the ballot box in the foyer today. And information is there and in your bulletin. Nomination is closed on Wednesday, May 17th. Election is Wednesday, June 21st, so please be ready for that. We thank you for your faithful worship of tithes and offerings to the Lord. You can give today through normal tithes and offerings right in the donation box if you'd like. And uh, you can do that digitally as well online. God bless you today. I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Corey and the worship team. They're going to lead us in worship today. Why don't you say it again? Thank you. 
Verse 7 says, But we are living in the light as God is in the light. Then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Isn't that wonderful? This was actually written to believers. To believers in Jesus. Sometimes we can think of this verse only for people that haven't put their faith in Jesus. For people who, who haven't trusted Jesus. But John goes on to say in verse 8 of 1 John 1, If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. Aren't you glad today that we, through faith in Jesus Christ, can have life to the full? Isn't that great? Isn't it wonderful that He took the punishment of our shame, our sin, our wrong on Himself? That through faith in Him we can be free. We're going to do something called communion. We're going to celebrate together in worship with symbols that you may have received when you came in. They're on a table on the way in. There's some here. There's some at the back of the auditorium there. And these are little cups of juice and a little cracker in the bottom. It's a symbol. It's something that Jesus told us to do in remembrance of Him. In worship of Him. And these reminders, I don't know about you, but I always need a reminder. I, that's, that's why post-it notes exist. They're a reminder. Well, this is a reminder of Jesus' purchasing our life in the light. First John 1. Our life in the light. Can we pause for a moment in His presence? Jesus, I thank you for this occasion and thank you for this simple piece of cracker and a little bit of juice, symbols that remind me of your broken body and your shed blood for our sins, the payment for our sins, the remission of our sins. I thank you, Lord, that we can confess our sins to you and you're faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, that this that we celebrate today is, is a reminder is a symbol, is, a, is another fresh expression of worship and love to you. This act that we do is not in and of itself a cleansing experience, but it's just a proclamation of your love for us and our love for you. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. We pause, Lord, in your presence. And in a worshipful way, we partake in this reflecting and loving you. Thank you for choosing to take my sin on yourself. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The story of redemption is written on his hands. Thank you, Jesus. Let's eat the bread together and worship. Juice, we praise you that we can live in the light as you are light. That we have fellowship with you, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. First John 1 7. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. We're forever. Let's 
worship the Lord that we're going to pray. Desperate situations, Lord. 
people who are very, very discouraged today. Individuals who are struggling under the weight of financial difficulty. People that are experiencing conflict in relationships, Lord. People that are struggling under the crushing weight of grief, Lord. People that are experiencing the, the challenges of debt. People that are feeling the ravages of guilt from the past, Lord. Loved ones that weigh on our hearts today. We're worried for them. We love them. We care about them. We want them to know you, Jesus, as Savior. You see, Lord, these and much more needs than these, so we give them to you. We can't handle them. We weren't designed to handle them. We can't handle the stress. We can't handle the worry, but you can, God. You're the miracle working God. You're the God of the impossible. So, Lord, we give you those things right now in the name of Jesus. In our hearts and our minds, we relinquish them. We say, God, you take it. You take it. Well, you take it. We can't. Do miracle works for your name's sake, God. Do the impossible. Work supernaturally. Pray today for Toby, Lord, who was burnt this morning, the little boy that comes to play cafe. We just pray that you would work in that situation, help his family, help his mom and his siblings. And we just pray that you would have your way. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We love you. We proclaim you with our hearts and our words. You, Jesus, are the hope of the world. You, Jesus, are the Savior. We bless you, Lord. Can we sing this song again in worship to the Lord? Paul stops out, friends. Let's just let's just love him for a couple more minutes together.
significant birthday, perhaps. <laughs> but I'm just going to leave it at that and ask him about it. against all sinful, wicked people 
who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful thing their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. And they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffer within themselves the penalty they deserve. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things they should ne that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. Boastful. They invented new ways of sinning, and they disobeyed their parents. They refused to understand break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They knew God's justice required that, required that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet, they do them anyways. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. God's blessing is upon his word. Let's bow the word of prayer. Father, I just pray that you will hide me behind the cross this morning. And I pray that you'll give me the right words to say and the right words not to say. To speak boldly where I should and not to speak where I shouldn't. I pray for your wisdom and for your direction. I pray for an anointing upon the word of God this morning. Speak to us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to know I believe this book. From Genesis to the Mass. This is the authoritative word of God. It has been God-breathed. Not only was it God breathed and inspired in its original text, but I believe that God has protected and sheltered the scriptures as it has been brought down from age to age, and we have here the true authentic word of God.
the scripture that I just read. Whether we like it or not is the word of God. And God, and, and the things that are deflected there, we, it's like, it's like taking the paper. The, the things that are depicted that people were doing, they are doing today like never before. And God says, those that do such things. In verse 30, 32 it says, they shall die. Now I want you to understand what it means by die. When the word die or death is used in the Bible, it simply means separation. There's three kinds of death. There's spiritual death. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we at one time were in spiritual death denying God. That spiritual death. Until we're saved and born of the Spirit, we are spiritually dead. But thank the Lord through the new birth and through the coming of the Holy Spirit, we are made alive. And then there's physical death. That's when our bodies are put in the ground. That's separation from physical life. Then there is eternal death which is the judgment of God, and that eternal death uh, speaks of the judgment of God in a place called hell. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, hallelujah, is eternal life. But it says those that do these things, they shall die. Verse 18 from the New Living Translation that I was reading from says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The NIV puts it this way. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress truth by their wickedness. If the description here in the first chapter of Romans isn't valid enough, the Apostle Paul picks up the same thing when he writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The first five verses, it says this. Mark this. There will be Terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying his power, have nothing to do with such people. We're living in a time, and I re reserve my remarks to North American culture, but we're living in a time when we've taken God out of our educational system. For the most part, we've taken God out of government and out of society in general. And rather than having a society that respects God and spiritual things, we have become a secular society. It wasn't that long ago when the province of Quebec uh, emphasized that we are no longer a religious society. We are a cultural society that uh, uh, gives no place for religion.
Many preachers deny the authenticity of the Bible, don't believe in miracles, don't believe in the divinity of Jesus, supports lifestyles which the Bible calls sin, and I could go on and on and on. In the U.S., over 65 million abortions, 65 million abortions, that's more than the total population of Canada have been aborted. 3,000 abortions occur every day in the United States. Here in Canada, the statistics I got from 1921 were that the hospitals reported over 20,000 abortions. If that's not bad enough, non-hospital reports indicated that there were 67 abortions that took place that day. Be very sure that judgment is coming. This is not a popular message. This is not a message that most preachers preach about. I'm sure I have referred to it, but this is the first message that I have preached that is entitled to the judgment of God. Yet, the judgment of God is an important doctrine of the Word of God. Our text refers to it as the anger of heaven, or describes it as the wrath of God, after Billy Graham had written a book about, he talked about the end times, his wife Ruth Graham said, if God doesn't try to judge America for its sin, he's going to have to apologize for judging Sodom and Gomorrah. A great portion of the book of Revelation deals with the judgment on the wrath of God. But let us consider some other scriptures, and they'll be on the screen for you. Psalms 96.13 says, Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for He comes. He comes to judge the world. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in His faithfulness. Ecclesiastes 12 14. God will bring every deed to judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. John 3 18 says this Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's only Son. Romans 2.5 says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and dead, and dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. And he goes on to the charge to get to preach the word, be instant in season, and other seasons, and other things that he's told Timothy that he should do in light of the coming judgment of God. First Peter 4 5 says, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. One more verse. Second Peter 3.7. By the same word, 
the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. We think of the future judgment, and it is terrible. But think about this. That's the greatest of the judgments in Romans 1 is when the society becomes so bad that God gives up on the society and lets them do whatever they want to do. It would seem to me that that's about where we're at in North America. Thank God if we're saved and we want to follow God that he corrects and he deals and he admonishes. But when a society or a person or people go too far, it says that my spirit will not always strive with people, but he will abandon them to let people do whatever they want to do. That's the worst kind of judgment. Now I want to take a moment, how are we to view the coming judgment of God that's going to come upon this world? Well, I want to view it from three perspectives. I want to view it from a humanistic point of view. By a humanistic point of view, I mean something like what Solomon saw. When he went in Ecclesiastes, he says that he saw everything under the sun from a natural point of view. And when he looked at things from a natural point of view, he said, life doesn't have a purpose, it has no meaning. When we remove God from the equation, and we don't want to admit that there is a God, then life becomes meaningless. And people lose hope. And there's an escalating of depression. Men's hearts failing them from fear and suicide. Which is almost a pandemic in certain areas. That's where much of society is today. On a whole, society wants to ignore that there is a God and they don't want to confess or even admit that there is sin and don't want to believe that there's anything after this life when you're putting the ground up that's it and don't like to believe in a life after a death if they do conceive life after death it's some type of heaven but never hell judge them for their sin. 
We all know the verse in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Whoever sows to please the flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. So whoever sows to the spirit of the spirit reaps eternal life. Hebrews 12, 27 reminds us, just as people are destined to die once, and after that, the judgment. Well, we understand that God will judge people. There is a day of accountability that we're going to face one day. Not only will individuals have to stand, stand before the righteous judge, but also God at times judges nations. He certainly did that with Israel. But it's no different with other nations. Ezekiel tells us in Ezekiel 14, 12 to 13, the word of the Lord came unto me. Son of man, if that country sins against me by being unfaithful and I stretch out my hand against them to cut them off, they will be judged. We've already said that a great part of the book of Revelation deals with the judgment of God in the last days. We are nearing the end of this age, and the judgment of God is about to fall upon this earth. We know that it will happen after the rapture, during the time of tribulation. But God could very well begin to pour out his judgment upon the world even before that. Perhaps, perhaps, events like 9-11 and the increased number of natural disasters is a sign that the judgment of God is already starting to fall upon this world. Then, we view this from a humanistic point of view, we view it from a biblical point of view, but I want to view the judgment of God from a personal point of view. I must be honest that the thought of the judgment of God scares me skinny. It frightens me. But I do believe I have some understanding of why it will occur. I know that God is a God of love. That is a given and must ever be, be paramount in our concept. He's not, it's not just one of his characteristics, he is love. However, I also know that God is a just and a righteous God. In order, and in order to maintain his righteousness and justice, there has to be a day of accountability to those who refuse to accept him and serve him and disobey him. When I see North America with all its violence and wickedness, and right here in this wonderful dominion of ours, it's getting increasingly dangerous to ride on the transit systems of our major cities. And we see the violence. When I see the disintegration of biblical morality, 
When I see the denial that there is a God, and when I see the lifestyle that is being promoted by politicians and leaders and educators, I must say that I don't see much hope for North America. You might say, Pastor, you're being pessimistic. Maybe so, and I'm not normally that way. I'm an optimist by, by nature. But it's time that we opened up our eyes and woke up to where this country is headed. And it's on a fast track to hell. Excuse me, please, or what? So how, so how are we to respond to this? That's a good question. Well, if we're the, the humanists that deny that there is a God, and deny that there's any accountability for our actions, then if you have that kind of attitude, You're going to say, you know, there's no consequences. And well, society today might be concerned for this planet that we call Earth, and concerned for its environment, yet they take very little concern for eternity. Well, it is true, we need to be concerned for this planet, but I want you to know that there is a day of judgment coming. There there is something more important than the environment, and it's in our eternal destiny. Yeah. We need to wake up. Jesus said this in Matthew 24. As it was in the days of Noah, and remember this, the flood was the judgment of, of, of God upon that Antilopian world that denied God that their thoughts were only continually wicked. And God almost repented that he had created man uh, so he was going to be, uh, put, cause his judgment to come upon this world with the flood. But thank the Lord, there was a few righteous people and the heaven was no. Now, if you don't think, if you think the flood story of Genesis chapter 4, I think it is, is a fable, then you've got to say that Jesus wasn't telling the truth when he says, as it was in the days of Noah, Jesus believed in the flood. It's in, your red, it's in the red print in your Bible. But here's what he said. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up till the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood and cook, took them all away. That's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, I think it's very interesting. Jesus didn't give the whole story. If you just read the words of Jesus, he said they were eating, drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, they were just going on oblivious to what was about to happen. Now we know that there was they were doing a lot of wicked things. But the point that Jesus is making, and this is where we're at in the world today, we're living in a society of denial. 
that the judgment of God is the whole half eating, drinking, just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we will die. And when they say die, they don't mean judgment. They mean they're just going to become dust in the ground. But interestingly, they said that they didn't even know that destruction was coming. And yet, Noah, for all the time that he was building that ark, was warning them. But they didn't hear. They were deaf. Because they refused to hear the truth. We're living in a world just like that today. They're going on. Case the daughter, the daughter, whatever it will be, will be. Yeah, it will be. But there's judgment coming, Jesus said. Most people just, just ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist. But then there's another group of people that are very cynical and come against the church and come against the gospel. And Peter deals with that kind of people also in 1 Peter 3, 3 to 7. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it had since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of the waters and by the waters and by these waters also the world at that time was deluged and destroyed by the same word the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly thus says God Just as truly as the world was judged because of its sin through the flood, it's going to be judged again, only this time, by fire. So how are we to respond to the coming judgment of God? Well, that's how the ungodly respond. But how are we to respond from a biblical point of view? How, how, from a biblical point of view, how do we respond to all this? The first thing that I would like to say from a biblical point of view is that we need to understand biblical prophecy we need to understand the Word of God, and we, under, we need to understand the day in which we live. In 1 Chronicles 12.32, we read that the men of Issachar had an understanding of the times. People, we need to have an understanding of the times. We need to have an understanding of where we live in relationship to the coming day of the Lord. You may say, oh, well, Pastor, well, no one knows the hour or the day. That's true, but I want, I want you to hear the word of God. Well, we might not understand the day and the hour. We can understand the days that we live in and where it is in relationship to the coming judgment of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 to 8, speaking to the church. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, that that day should surprise you like a thief. You were all children of light 
and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep in the night, and those who get drunk, get drunk in the night. But since you belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. We ought to be on the vigil. We need to watch. We need to be ready. We don't want to be like the five foolish virgins. We need to have our lamps trimmed and be ready for Jesus is about to break the eastern sky. So how are we to respond? Understand. It's time for the church to wake up. This brings me to the last point. How are we to respond from a personal point of view? How am I to respond? Well, I've got good news here. First and foremost, understand that if you're a born-again Christian, that your sins have already been dealt and judged for on the cross. We will never have to get an answer, an answer for our sins. Our sins were nailed to the cross. And, I, and, he said, and the hymn writer says, and I remember it no more. Amen. Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. I do not live under condemnation. I do not live under the fear of the wrath and the judgment of God. That was taken care of. Jesus took care of it 2,000 years ago. The wrath of God was poured upon him. The day that Jesus said, My God, my God, why has you forsaken me? At that moment, the sins of the world were placed upon Jesus. The wages of sin is death. He didn't die for his sin. He had no sin. He died for your sin. He died for my sin. He died for the sins of all who put their faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross. Hallelujah. This is the point where they, you might not have been able to say amen, but at this point, someone said hallelujah. This is the good news. Hallelujah. Then, well, the thought of a coming judgment upon this world for its sins, and disobedience is a very depressing thought. There is still hope for a coming revival and a moving of the Holy Spirit. I must say, from the natural point of view, and from looking at our contemporary society here in North America, I don't see much hope. I see the impending judgment of God coming upon this continent that once had a faith in God, that have turned their back on God as well. I know, I, I know there's some, I know there's some great churches, and I know they come, but I know, I, I'm talking about gentle society. Then I read that in Thessalonians in the last days there's going to be a falling away. This is depressing. But I can look at every church that I pastored. And pretty near every one of them have less people attending today than they did when I pastored. And one of those churches is closed and one of them is hemorrhaging to death. Look at 
Let's not deny it. However, because I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and because I believe in the promises of God's Word, I believe there's hope. I preached a little while ago about Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones. You want to know something? Ezekiel said, can these bones live? And if God can bring life out of dead, dry bones, God can bring life out of the church today, God can bring life uh, into, the, into the North American society, and there can be one more good move of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Judgment is coming as Upon this world, as sure as it did in Noah's time. But there can be a move of God. I want you to know that 2 Chronicles 7.14 still is true. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Someone has it, has it, an amen. amen. Yes, judgment is coming. But this is no time to throw in the sponge and to give up. God can still pour out his spirit. One more time. I say, Lord, give us one more revival. Give us a fresh move of the Holy Spirit. The only thing, the only thing that is stopping from Jesus to come right now. All the signs have been fulfilled. There's nothing that has to happen. The only reason that he hasn't come is that Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank the Lord we're still in the day of grace. God's given us the Holy Spirit for power to share the gospel with a lost, dying world that is heading to judgment if they don't repent of their sins. I want to give you, I think, one last scripture. Maybe not. It's a humbling scripture. But here it is. Ezekiel 33, 7 to 9. Son of man, I've made you a watch for the people of Israel or for our society today. So hear the word of the Lord, I speak, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked persons, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you warn the wicked persons to turn from their ways and they do not do so. They will die in their sin though you yourself will be saved. We need some modern day John the Baptist declaring prepare you the way of the Lord. Church, we are all to be John the Baptist. 
in these last days before Jesus comes back again we need to be a voice in the wilderness crying prepared in the way of the Lord well it wasn't my last picture I could do one more with this I conclude 1 Peter 4 17 for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of the Lord. And if it first begins with us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Worship team, come please. Could that judgment be the judgment upon us believers who have failed to warn this world of the impending judgment of God. I don't know how you are going to respond to this message. But if there's one person that needed to hear this message, if I prepared this message for only one person, it was prepared for me. And I'm going to be the first to get to the altar this morning. Would you stand with us? Can you lead us? And if you feel like responding, coming to this altar. Look, if you don't know Jesus, you better get to this altar. Jesus Christ is coming soon and you need to get ready. You need to receive Jesus on your heart. But we as Christians need to understand Jesus said, you look under the harvest and you say, you think there's four months, but I say unto you, the fields are already right to hearts. We don't have the lunch on time. These are serious days and we need to be sober and we need to be on the lookout for Jesus is coming soon. Let's not be children of the night but let's be children of the day and the Lord. And let us be the salt that this world needs. If ever a society needs a salt, a saving element, it's our society today that is decaying in sin. So we invite you to respond however you feel. The altars are open. Daniel, lead us in.